So, hello everyone. I would like to introduce you uh, our next speaker, uh, Maroš. Maroš is a general manager of Slovak Game Developers Association, and besides taking care or of all Slovak games, he's also also working for Slovak uh, Museum of Design, and he is working on translating the games for um, for audiences. Uh, so Maroš will tell you more about this. I'm gonna. Passing the word, thank you. Thank you. So this is the lecture with the best attendance so far. Um, if you are not planning to change your mind and run away, uh, feel free to come a bit closer so you can have a little bit of a uh, more intimate atmosphere. Is there anyone English speaking here? Only? Great. So you're my target audience. Come here, guys. I promise that this won't be a too long lecture and it won't be too boring even though the subject uh, sounds like it is. So, uh, anyway, yeah, like uh, Maciej said, my name, is Ma my name is Maroš Brojo, I work for the Slovak Design Museum uh, while also working uh, for the Slovak Game Developers Association. Uh, we are very lucky in Slovakia that there is a public institution that is actually interested in uh, preserving uh, games and doing some historical research on games. Shout out to Maria Ryškova, the former director of the museum, who, uh, who allowed us to make this happen. Uh, anyway, so we have a collection of uh, old uh, Slovak games, all the new ones also, in the museum. And uh, except, or besides trying to preserve them, search for them, find the new ones that were lost in the fairly brief history. Uh, we also try to do some, uh, you know, public outreach and try to get the history uh, to people uh, in Slovakia especially. Uh, but with this project also we tried to uh, spread the games a bit more also for, a bro for uh, international audiences. So uh, how it works and why we are doing this, uh, first and foremost, uh, a little bit of context when it comes to the history of Slovak games. Uh, we have a fairly long history. I mean, it's not as long as you have the history of US or Japanese games, for example, ranging to, I don't know, 60s, uh, 70s being the era of arcade, 80s being the era of uh, Atari and the big crash uh, of the video game industry. Uh, for us, it was a bit later uh, in the 80s, uh, which is the period where the first uh, personal computers in Slovakia were starting to be a bit more widespread. Uh, and these computers were, uh, first and foremost, the ZX Spectrum, which is a fairly well-known 8-bit computer uh, coming from UK uh, and being fairly widespread all around Europe. And then since ZX Spectrum wasn't really sold in Slovakia, but it had to be smuggled from Germany, which a lot of people did, uh, mostly in boxes from chocolate because they had the best form factor for smuggling computers. At that time, uh, we also started to manufacture clones of ZX Spectrum called the didactic, didactic computers manufactured by a factory called Didactic Skalica. Uh, there were like two or three versions of those. They were a bit cheaper than the ZX Spectrum, so they became more, more widespread. Uh, just to imagine the cost of uh, one Didactic was between 2,500 uh, 2, to 3,500 Slovak, Czechoslovak crowns. Uh, and the average salary at that time was somewhere between 1,000 to 2,000 Czechoslovak crowns. So you had to save a lot to actually be able to buy a computer back then. Yeah. So uh, there wasn't really a lot of use for the computers uh, at that time, uh, since we were, as a former Soviet Union state, lacking behind in informatization and digitalization. Uh, so a lot of those computers ended up at homes and ended up in the hands of uh, fairly young people, mostly teenagers still attending middle schools uh, that had originally no technical skills. They didn't study programming or anything like that. And their first contact with the computer and with programming were these kinds of computers uh, that were supporting basic programming language and also assembler. And so all these people were basically self-taught programmers and this is the beginning of programming and computer development, uh, digital game development uh, in Slovakia. Uh, since, like I mentioned, most of the programmers were self-taught and they were amateurs or homebrew creators, 
uh, they weren't really that skilled. So logically, uh, the go-to game genre for them was obviously text adventure games because that's the simplest, uh, simplest game that you can do. You still have a lot of interactivity, but it's basically based only on text. You don't need to have any pictures, graphics, or moving elements or anything like that. Even though there were a lot of people that were also creating a bit more action-oriented games. Uh, yeah, so this is how it looked like back then, and uh, people were, no internet obviously, people were, were meeting in various clubs all around Slovakia, exchanging games, mostly on cassette tapes, like the regular ones that you used for playing music uh, in a Walkman, uh, since this was the medium of choice for people uh, using didactic and Zenith Spectrum computers, and so there was a, like a very small uh, and very scattered community all around the major cities in Slovakia, basically teenagers meeting and discussing games, software, copying uh, everything to each other. You couldn't really buy anything legally because there was no official distribution of software uh, or games in Slovakia, so the only way of distributing were meeting people and exchanging uh, software among each other, like maybe some of you did in school, burning CDs or copying uh, floppy disks or USB keys, I don't know how it works nowadays. Uh, yeah, so uh, this is how it looked like before, and text adventures, uh, why we decided to focus on text adventures, obviously the reason is very simple. Uh, you don't really need to translate action games. Uh, you can really guess how to get to the game through the main menu, and then there's nothing really to, to look at when it comes to reading text. But text adventures are very different, it's the complete opposite, you can't really play uh, the game without understanding the language it's written in because it's basically just pure text. Uh, and since this was before 1989, before, uh, before the fall of socialism, uh, the Slo English language wasn't really that widespread. Most of the people uh, had mandatory Russian language in schools, uh, so nobody was really thinking about writing games uh, in English. So all these text adventures uh, that we have, which are some of the earliest games in Slovakia are in Slovak, uh, which means that we can play them without any problems, but you really can't. Which is a real shame because this is the earliest history uh, of games and uh, people from abroad that are interested in researching local histories of video game development have basically no chance of understanding what's going on. And uh, up until now, the only way how to learn about those games were to basically contact people in Slovakia that would be willing to give them some context and maybe to retell some of the stories that were in those games. Uh, so that's the, like, the most obvious reason, but also there are other reasons too. Uh, text adventures actually are an extremely important genre at that time because an action game is, I mean, I don't really want to uh, you know, put those games down in a way, but uh, these were the games that carried the most information, that were the, like, you could actually get some relevant information on various topics from those from an action game. The action game basically communicates only itself and the action from the game, but a text adventure doesn't have to communicate only the game itself, but you can also get a lot of context uh, from it. Uh, like the context regarding the historical period where it was created. Uh, a lot of times the authors were uh, like leaving notes one to, to each other because the, they knew each other throughout Slovakia, you know, because of the unofficial distribution and copying of the games. So there were like instances where one of the authors was dissing the second author, like your text adventure game sucks and mine is better, you know, and a lot of fun interactions there. Um, also, some of the people, and this is also very interesting, like we are sort of getting back uh, back there. There was a lot long period of time where this was totally abandoned in games, but uh, people actually reflected on the stuff that was going on. They reflected on how they were not satisfied with the things going on in society and stuff like that, making fun of the totalitarian regime that we had. And all this stuff is basically reflected in the text adventure games. Um, which is great because that's one of the proofs that games can actually be a relevant medium, an artistic medium or I don't know, some sort of medium that communicates not only fun but some, you know, more important meanings. Uh, yeah, so uh, that's it.
and we want to enable the international audience to be able to experience this and to learn a bit about what was going on. So, uh, yeah, and one more reason or one more motivation for us was there's this great book by Jaroslav Schwelk, which I strongly recommend, published by MIT Press, called Gaming the Iron Curtain, which is basically the, like, the Bible of Slovak and Czech or Czechoslovak game development history, the only book that uh, deals comprehensively with the history of games in Czech and Slovakia. Uh, really great reading, fascinating. And the, in the beginning of the book, Jaroslav Schwelk mentions that uh, it is very important to focus not only on like the bigger picture, the, the big history of uh, global game development, which is very well known. Yeah, you, we had United States, then we had Japan, there was Pac-Man and Space Invaders, and then there was the Crash, Atari, you know, all this stuff. This is like the well-known history uh, of global game development, but it basically overshadows the local histories, uh, local micro-histories uh, of other areas where people are also created games, like in every country, of Europe or all over the world, there were these small communities and groups of people that were making games that never make it into these global history books because Pac-Man is more important than some guy in Košice making a tech adventure games, a game that was played by 200 people back then. But for us it's very important because this is our history, so we also need to learn about it. Uh, yeah, so local micro-histories are super important and uh, quite often very fascinating. Uh, yeah, and then we need, we wanted to get all this to the professional community, to all the researchers and people writing books about games. Uh, there is, I think, an upcoming game uh, about the history of text adventures, uh, which also we will be mentioning uh, Slovakia and Slovak text adventure games, thanks to th thanks to this project. So there is actually professional interest, not only like uh, regular people and players being probably not that interested, but a lot of researchers, academics, university people uh, are doing a lot of research on these topics. All right, so uh, how we did the translation is not really that simple. It's not like we take the text, we translate it and then put it into a game. It's a bit more complex, obviously. Um, and not only because of the technical side of things, but also because other conditions that we imposed upon ourselves. Uh, and one of these conditions were, uh, was that, uh, like I mentioned in the beginning, uh, these didactic computers or ZX Spectrum computers uh, or any other type of console or computer like, I don't know, Nintendo Switch or uh, the original Game Boy, uh, there is this uh, very specific experience that you have with this very special type of hardware. Like with a Game Boy, you can play a game in a bus, or I don't know, you can be hanging from the ceiling upside down and still being able to play a game. With, I don't know, Super Nintendo, you had to blow into the cartridge if the game didn't load, and so on and so on, you know. And th this is also part of the gaming experience. It's not only about the game itself, it's also about how it was played, how you were actually experiencing like the whole big experience. Uh, also, you know, your age was a factor. You were 13 and you were fascinated by these moving pixels and stuff like that. And we wanted to preserve the original experience. So uh, it's, it was not only important for us to make those games playable again, not only, I don't know, translate screenshots or something like that, but also to allow people to not only be able to play them with emulators conveniently from their computer with, with the regular mouse and keyboard, but to be able to actually load them on the original hardware and experience the, those games like they were experienced in the 80s. Um, so we decided to translate the ROMs that would be able to be you know, loaded into the didactic spectrum and ZX spectrum computers, uh, basically to achieve historical accuracy of the experience. Yeah, there were some limitations there, obviously. Uh, so I'm not sure how familiar you are with the ZX Spectrum computer, uh, but uh, the most or the, the biggest the program could be was either 48 kilobytes or 128 kilobytes. And most of these games in their original state uh, were already basically filling up the whole capacity uh, of the RAM at the time. So we couldn't really exceed it. 
And um, maybe as you probably know, when you are translating something, it doesn't always come up in the same length not only in terms of words, but also in terms of characters, including spaces. So uh, there were a lot of very strict limitations uh, for the translators to be able to not, uh, you know, uh, to be able to fit the translations into these very limited uh, counts of characters, uh, which also sometimes resulted in Stuff like uh, that they had to make a lot of shortcuts or they had to change, I don't know, a uh, pistol to a different kind of gun because the name of the gun was shorter, for example, and stuff like that. Uh, while also trying to preserve most of the meaning uh, that was originally there, uh, then it was also very hard for the translators to like communicate some of the stuff that was in the games uh, that you wouldn't really understand nowadays because it was like 30 or 40 years ago and you have no idea what the, uh, I don't know, Moskvich is. And it was a car back then that most of the people had in Russia and we have no idea what it is. And there is a joke in one of the games making fun of these cars breaking down all the time, for example. Uh, so you had to somehow translate this and make it a different car that the modern audience would understand while still preserving the original meaning. Yeah, there was also a lot of internal humor there that I mentioned before, like people leaving notes to each other that also doesn't really translate. You have no idea what who Palo Cheka is nowadays. So that has to somehow be contextualized. And yeah, some other stuff. Uh, and also uh, inappropriate content when it comes to modern sensibilities, meaning like people using the word gypsy instead of Roma, for example, why not really meaning it in a pejorative way? Uh, but nowadays we don't really use the word gypsy, we use the word Roma. So uh, some of that stuff also has to be uh, changed in the modern translation while again, trying to keep the content there and the meaning uh, as it was originally intended. Yeah, so we started doing this two years ago. Uh, in the first year, we translated around 10 games. Uh, this year, we are, like now, we are finishing with another 30 titles. Uh, these are some of the loading screens from the games. So this is how, the, like, this is most of the graphics of those games. Like I mentioned before, uh, after the loading screen, you just get text and that's it. Uh, but uh, yeah, the graphics actually are uh, in a way pretty beautiful and very interesting. And uh, yeah, an interesting thing is that uh, most of the time, if you're trying to search for an author, uh, this is the only part of the game when you have a chance to find it. Most of the people were leaving their names there. Some of them even leaving their addresses and phone numbers in the credits of the games which is also really interesting. None of, the num none of those numbers work nowadays, obviously, because those were landlines and nobody uses those anymore. Uh, but yeah, still, you could basically see an address and go and knock on the door of the guy that made the game. Um, maybe just briefly about some of those games. Uh, in the bottom right corner, this guy over here is called Major Shatohin. Uh, this is probably the game that was most reflective when it comes to the previous regime. It was basically a black humor game making fun of the stereotypical socialist hero that most of the teenagers in the 80s knew uh, from movies back then. Uh, it was made by Stanislav Herda in uh, 1988, if I remember correctly. Uh, and the basic premise of the whole game was that there is this uh, there's this bad guy called Rambo in Vietnam that is decimating all the friendly soldiers of the socialist regime. And we need to send Major Shatohin to destroy him. And it was obviously all fun and irony uh, because uh, the creator, Stanislav Herda, was a big fan of Rambo. They had a, they had a cassette uh, of the movie at home uh, that he liked to play and he decided to basically make fun of it and to make uh, Shuratokhin and Rambo duel between each other. Uh, and there is even an Easter egg in the game, probably the first Easter egg in Slovak games. Uh, in the main menu of the game, you can define the controls 
but it doesn't really make sense because you use commands like go right, left, forward that you regularly type uh, into the interface. Uh, and you can only define three controls and the menu doesn't say what you're defining. But if you input KGB in there, you get a secret ending in the game where uh, you don't play as Mayor Shatohin, but uh, you know the tides are turning. You play as Rambo, you're, uh, you're like 70 years old, and you meet uh, Shatohin again in the, like my English is failing now, but you know the house for old people. And uh, during the night you kill him by stuffing him with your uh, smelly socks. So, <laughs> yeah. Uh, one more game, maybe. Uh, there were a lot of trends in the games. Uh, another interesting trend, uh, we had like five, six games like this. People were actually making literary adaptations of famous stuff like La Dame Monsoreau, I don't know how, it, uh, how it's pronounced, by Alexander Dumas. So people actually were already perceiving games in the beginning as a relevant artistic medium to actually convey all these classical pieces of art and literature. Uh, there is an adaptation of one of the stories with Sherlock Holmes, for example. We don't really get a lot of that nowadays, or are, like I mentioned, are slowly getting back to actually taking games really seriously and even adapting this uh, sort of art. Um, and another interesting trend, for example, is um, that in the 80s, it wasn't like we couldn't really know or see anything coming from uh, from the West, people were like the author of Shatohin already knew about movies like Rambo or another art author, Branislav Havas, she already knew what Pepsi Cola was. And he was probably a big fan of Pepsi Cola because that game is about you trying to steal the second half of the recipe for Pepsi Cola to be able to make your own. Uh, the game doesn't really say where the first half is. I guess that's like a plot hole or something, I don't know. And some other bizarre games, uh, this one over here is called Perfect Murder in English and it's a murder simulator, something that wouldn't really work out nowadays. I don't know if you know the game Manhunt, which is like a really gruesome game about murdering people and basically no other meaning there. Um, this is something similar, you are the murderer, you input your name into the game in the beginning. Uh, you can also input the name of your victim, so if you like hate your sister or your ex r really a lot, you can murder him in the game. And then the whole game is about like getting alibi, getting the right gun, running out of there, and you know, you have to spend the budget on all these things. And then in the end, the game evaluates if you were successful and if you were caught or if you managed to escape. Um, so yeah, really bizarre. Um, there's a hint to winning that is spending as much money as you can basically makes you win the game. Um, and another important thing about this game is that it was created by Ludovic Vitek. Uh, I don't know if you can see it here, but uh, the name of the studio here is called Ultrasoft. And this wasn't really a company back then. But after 1989, where people were actually allowed to create their own companies and do business, uh, he actually created Ultrasoft as a regular company and became the first distribution company for games, for Czech and Slovak games in Slovakia. So this, for example, is a very important guy for the history of games uh, in our region. All right, so uh, that's just very briefly, just so you have an idea about how interesting and maybe fun those games could be and why it's actually worth translating them uh, so that people know a bit more about them. This is an example of how it actually looked when it translated it. So we were basically decoding the original ROMs from those games. We had, we had a guy called Stanislaw Lapsky for that, which was a programmer, a big fan of, uh, of ZX Spectrum and he's like one of the leading people of the Slovak demo scene still actually creating software and demos for ZX Spectrum nowadays uh, during the day working as a, like a hardcore uh, security analyst for Asset which is an antivirus company so he's like he sees metrics he doesn't see stuff like we do he just sees running numbers and zeros and ones uh, he's a really awesome coder that created his own software to actually extract the text 
and filter out the text that were actually displayed in the game out of the code and I don't know, some, some programming magic that I don't really understand at all. Uh, so this guy pulled out all the text, then uh, the translators received the text, they had to maintain all the limitations that I was talking about. Uh, then we got the text, got it prov proofread by a native speaker and then he implemented it back into the original game files and if you would uh, record those play files, uh, the, those original files as audio files to the cassette, you could actually load the translated game into ZX Spectrum and play it on an old CRT TV, which is really cool. If you didn't want to do that, like load the cassette five times until it works and wait seven minutes every time, uh, or pressing a wrong key and breaking the whole software before it even launched, you can just play it on an emulator, which is really great well, for convenience. Uh, yeah, so this is just one example of how it actually looks. We maintained all the colors, the fonts, all the stuff uh, as close to the original as possible. Even though some of the fonts are super unreadable, which is very inconvenient, but it's historically accurate. So, sorry for that. Yeah, and then we made the press release and uh, we were shocked <laughs> because uh, the, Ver the Verge wrote about us Kotaku and Vice too. Uh, we were not really prepared for that kind of uh, publicity and for that kind of interest. Uh, but it made us really happy and uh, it persuaded us that it actually made sense to do that, which is great. Uh, it all actually started by Andrada Fisku team. Shout out to her and thank you very much for uh, retweeting our post. Uh, she actually wrote an uh, article about the game, uh, about the book by Jaroslav Schwelf that I mentioned in, in the beginning for Ars Electronica. So she already was sort of interested and invested into our local history uh, because she was writing about it several years ago. So she retweeted us and we got like 2,545 uh, retweets from her. And then it was like, you know, Kotaku one day, wise another day. Video Game History Foundation also acknowledged our project, which is really nice. Uh, NPR was contacting us. They wanted to make an interview. It didn't really happen in the end, but again, very nice of them. Uh, so this was really great. We were really happy. But uh, there are also some problems there that we could have addressed and unfortunately didn't, which, bring us, which brings us to like almost the end of the lecture. So like I mentioned, we were not prepared for the big interest of the pro that the project generated, uh, which wasn't really that problematic. Problematic was that the people that uh, learned about those games and downloaded them didn't really have the best experience that we could have provided. Uh, so we got a lot of publicity last year and now we are finishing those the, like the second round of translation, those 13 more games, nobody will write about that anymore, so that's a shame for those 30 games, they won't really get that much attention. We should have probably waited one more year to go public with all this. Um, yeah, uh, what we underestimated is, and didn't realize in the beginning since we are working with these games, is that these games don't really have any like regular conventions, like the modern games have, like you know that if you press V, S, A, D, you will probably move. Uh, all these games, they had different controls, different conventions, different schemes, or no conventions at all. People didn't really know how to play those. There were no guides back then, there were no control schemes described in the manuals because all these games were homebrew and amateur games. And what we should have done is provide some guidance for the people to be able to play those games, which we didn't. So a lot of people actually quit playing those games fairly early because they didn't know what to do. Uh, controls wouldn't be that problematic. Somehow you would probably be able to figure them out sooner or later. But uh, the guides and walkthroughs, I think, were much more important because uh, it's not important for the project, uh, for the people that play those games to 
figure it out all by themselves, it's important for them to be able to play the whole game and to just read what's going on there and stuff like that. And we, we didn't really provide uh, enough guidance for, for those people. So we are fixing that now, but you know, like I mentioned, the, like the big wave of publicity is already behind us. So unfortunately, the people that were most interested uh, a year ago probably won't know about uh, the edit maps and guides uh, when we finish them now. Uh, we could have also provided more accompanying content and materials like photographs of those people or maybe interviews with the original authors, some more historical context. Uh, we did some articles and stuff like that, but it could have been more. But, I mean, to not be too pessimistic overall, we were very happy with how the project worked out and it basically persuaded us that it made a lot of sense. And uh, if you're from another country and you know somebody who's dealing with history uh, in your country, you can definitely let him know that something like this was going on in Slovakia, maybe you can get us in touch with him and we can provide some uh, guidance on how to do this, not only like this stuff that we didn't do, but also how we technically did it, uh, because we already have some tools developed for the translations and we know how it works, how on average, how much time one game game takes to be translated and implemented back and so on and so on. It's not that hard, it just takes a few months for, let's say, 10 games to be translated and we already have the know-how, which uh, we definitely want to share with other people because this is history, we won't really be able to earn any money out of it. Uh, we got the licensing agreements from all the authors, which is actually a topic that I didn't even talk about. It's really Surprisingly, not that hard to find people that you have no idea existed back then uh, because everybody has Facebook, LinkedIn, and so on and so on. You don't need to be China or CIA to find them. It's actually very, very easy. Um, so we managed to get all the licensing agreements from all those authors and uh, our condition that we opposed, uh, imposed on ourselves was that we don't want any commercial you know, uh, income from that. We don't want to sell the games. We have to and want to distribute them freely. So, yeah. Uh, and uh, if there would be anyone interested from other country to do this sort of stuff for their local micro history, which I'm pretty sure has to be very fascinating too, uh, we are very happy to provide some info and guidance. Uh, yeah, these are some credits. So the, this is, like I mentioned before, uh, we wanted to maintain the historical accuracy of all the games, of all the content and all the stuff, but this is one thing that we added into each of those games, just so that people know what's going on, credits of all the people that were working on this project. So uh, this is an example of one of the loading screens. Uh, on each game, only one translator worked on that specific games, but on the right, these are all the translators that worked on all the 33 games. Yeah. And uh, that's it, basically. Thank you. If there are any questions, maybe you raise your hand or just shout or use Slido and I will read those out there. I would definitely say Shatochin is probably the most interesting one for uh, most of the people. Uh, but I mean, the, the thing is that all of those games, when we will have the guides for them ready, you will be able to play them in, I don't know, 10, 15, 13 minutes max. So it's, I mean, it's not really that much time to not try at least five of them, I don't know, and maybe you like some of them. The murder simulator obviously is very fun and very short. So that one I would definitely recommend to you. And what else? I don't know. Yeah, yeah just explore. I would say hundreds max. Because like I said, there was no official distribution. You couldn't buy a game in the store. 
the only way how to get the game was to meet the guy that already had it or to write a guy that was copying all the games, send him like seven check crowns uh, by post, you know, in an envelope, and he would send you a cassette with the game, which was uh, the most efficient uh, distribution of pirated games in Slovakia. So uh, yeah, not, not, many, not, not that many people. And another thing is that, uh, like you couldn't really criticize, you couldn't really make a movie like Shatohin, the game, and screen it publicly, uh, but people could do it in games, not because, I don't know, they didn't care, but because there wasn't a distribution, was non non-existent, and only hundreds of people played those, and it was all like your generation of people that really hated the regime too, so the authorities didn't even have an idea that these kind of games existed, so people were a bit more courageous to, you know, communicate all this stuff back there, uh, so yeah. Fifty plus. Yeah. Yeah, so, uh, were there any interesting reactions to what you got from different connections? Well, ah, uh, yeah. The thing is that some of them actually still are developing games nowadays. Uh, like uh, there is a game called Pomsta Revenge, made by David Durchak, which is the founder of the studio Caldron, which nowadays is called Nine Rock Games. Which are the guys from that made the... You work there, yeah. So for those of you that don't know, in that corner, Way of the Hunter is the latest game of David Durchak, which made the game in 1988, and it was called uh, Ponsta. So, mm, yeah, Marian Ferko too, uh, which is the second founder of uh, Caldron and Nino Games. His game is called Conan and the Magical Diamonds. It's a reskinned or rewritten game, uh, originally there was a Czech game that had the same structure and he just changed the texts uh, to make it a different game. Uh, that was his first game. So these two are examples of people that actually became professional game developers. Um, a lot of those people didn't really continue making games because it was just a hobby for them, but became like hardcore IT programmers ending up in Microsoft, living in Redmond in the US nowadays. So you actually had to make international calls, spending a lot of money to, to reach them, calling to Canada and United States. Uh, people emigrated as soon as they could, didn't even speak Slovak anymore, <laughs> almost. Uh, so yeah, a lot of, lot of those people learned their profession via making these games, actually, which is, I think, really cool. And then there are people that like created one game and I don't know, studied economics or something like that. A lot of them became managers, for example, this one guy in Dell that doesn't really deal with programming anymore, uh, which created like one game and then forgot about it. And uh, that's exactly the, like the situation that somebody's contacting me after 30 years. Did you make a Pepsi Cola game? And I was, I'm not sure, did I make a Pepsi Cola game 30 years ago? Maybe, I don't know. I need your signature because we can translate it. And even if it wasn't you, like you have the same name, give me your signature. But it was him actually, yeah. So uh, yeah, a lot of interesting stories. Um, and a lot of interesting life choices. Oh yeah, I shouldn't have probably mention that. Uh, there is this not really convenient long link. Uh, I can maybe write it down in the presentation. Yeah, sorry for that. That's another mistake that I had to add into our... Uh, so it's like this. Can I get the screen going, please? Sorry. So it's www.scd.sk, that's Slovak, Slovenska Centrum Designo slash games. And on that link, there is an article 
called translations of Slovak games, something, something. Uh, and you have uh, like more context there, article written by me, basically about the idea behind it, but also writing article from the main translator explaining how the translations worked, and also from Stano Hrda, the author of the Shatochin game, and Slavo Lapsky explaining in a very exhausting detail technically how the translations were made. So if there is a programmer over here, I definitely recommend reading about that. Uh, so yeah, all the games are there. Oh, at least the first 10 ones, we will be adding the 13 new ones, hopefully till end of this year. Any other questions? All right, so thank you very much. <laughs>